intuition or nature, intuition or nature. Jiva, Jiva, the living entity, the living entity. Eva, Eva, certainly, certainly. Cha, Cha, and Vasudevat, from Vasudeva, Pala, differentiated parts, Brahman, O Brahmana, Na, never, Cha, also, Anya, separate, Artha, value, Asti, there is, Tattvataha, in truth. This is a description here of the creation and how the creation unfolds. The five elementary ingredients of creation, the interaction thereof set up by eternal time, and the intuition or nature of the individual living beings are all differentiated parts and parcels of the personality of Godhead, Vasudev, and in truth, there is no other value in them. Hmm. Purport. This phenomenal world is impersonally the representation of Vasudev because the ingredients of its creation, their interaction, and the enjoyer of the results and actions, the living beings, are all produced by the external and internal energies of Lord Krishna. This is confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita 7.2. Four and five verses. The ingredients, namely earth, water, fire, air, and sky, as well as the conception of material identity, intelligence, and mind, are produced by the external energy of the Lord. The living entity who enjoys the interaction of the above gross and subtle ingredients, as set up by the eternal time, is an offshoot of the internal potency with freedom to reign either in the material world or in the spiritual world. In the material world, a living entity is enticed by deluding nations, but in the spiritual world, he is in his normal condition of spiritual existence without any delusion. The living entity is known as the marginal potency of the Lord, but in all circumstances, neither the material ingredients nor the spiritual parts and parcels are independent of the personality of Godhead, Vasudev, for all things, whether products or external, internal or marginal potencies of the Lord, are simply displays of the same effulgence of the Lord, just as light, heat, and smoke are displays of fire. None of them are separate from the fire. All of them, all of them combine together to be called fire. Similarly, all phenomenal manifestations, as well as the effulgence of the body of Vasudev, are his impersonal features, whereas he eternally exists in his transcendental form as Satchit Ananda Vigraha, distinct from all conceptions of the material ingredients mentioned above. Om Agya Timidanda Sya Gina Jana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasdaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Pucharine Nirvise Sasunya Vadi Pasyatya De Satarine Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Nithananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasari Gauravakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Vanchakopa Tarubis Chakriba Sindhu Beva Chabditanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha is a very uh, scientific explanation. But the actual summation of this whole thing, this whole verse is easy. Everything is Krishna. <laughs> Everything. And he's divided into two aspects of himself, his personality and his energies, which are considered to be the manifestation of his impersonal feature. 
So for the sake of creation, we're getting a little insight of how it, how it expands. Krishna creates the different ingredients, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligent, e, false ego, and it's manifested in a particular form known as the Mahatattva, or the Pradhan. Actually, the Pradhan, and during the interim, be, be, between the time when the Lord uh, withdraws all of the material creations into his own body, there is no material energy active. It lies within a dormant state, but it still exists. And when, according to the eternal time and the desire of the Lord, he manifests his energies in order to enact or to inspire the next creation. It's very interesting here how this happens. <clears throat> It's almost, it is not almost, it is actually a pattern how in the material world we see how the living entities come together in order to produce a child. So in the same way, this energy is also illustrated in the same, which is the original manifestation of existence. So Krishna, in the form of Maha Vishnu, he glances in the direction of the material energy, but that glance is not carried directly. By his power, it is given the power by his uh, internal energy, Ramadevi. She takes that glance, and in that glance there are three ingredients. Two of them are mentioned here. The third is not. Um, two of them, is one is the living entities all of the linti entities that have been situated in the body of the Mahavishnu for the interim period are now manifested in that glance along with the principle of eternal time. And the third feature is Lord Shiva, Sadashiva, the original Shiva. So sometimes they say the glance of Mahavishnu is none different than Lord Shiva. So these three aspects which make up the glance, the powerful glance of the Lord, is carried by his female in internal energy, Ramadevi, who is an expansion of Lakshmi Devi, and she carries it to the Pradhan, and that begins, the you know, as soon as that energy hits the Pradhan, it starts to, act, to activate and all of the earth, water, fire, air, mind, intelligence, and false egos start to move. And in that movement, then Brahma is created from the body of Garbhodakshai Vishnu. He takes those ingredients and then he formulates the next creation. Really, very interesting. Uh, sometimes it says that Lord Shiva is the father of all living entities. So this is where it's connected to that aspect that in that glance the original Shiva, there's a Shiva in every universe, but there's Sada Shiva, who manifests in this world as Advaita Acharya, Mahavishnu and Sada Shiva come together as Sri Advaita Acharya to assist the Lord in his pastimes. But that Lord Shiva is also called the father of all living entities. He has the power of the second super soul. There are three personalities that know all of living entities at all times and all places. One is Krishna in the heart as Sri Paramatma. The other is Lord Shiva, the original Shiva, Sada Shiva. And the third is Yamaraj. I mean, he, has, he has a job. <laughs> he has to see what we're doing <laughs> and make sure that uh, everything is calculated by his secretaries and then at the time of that living entity departs from that body, then he takes over and arranges for the next body. But in the interim period before that body is manifested, then the uh, living entity gets the results of their sinful activities and, uh, and pious activities, and then they're given the next body. So it's very interesting here. And all of these, all of this ingredients is all part of the impersonal, as it says here phenomenal of the Lord. In other words, it works through his energies. Parashya shakti virahaya suyate, svabhaviki jnana balakriya cha. 
So Krishna doesn't have to do anything. In fact, in, in fact, he simply desires, and by his desires, everything takes place. So when he desires that creation, things start to manifest, and the energies start to move in a direction to fulfill that desire. Everything is perfectly done. So when we think, when we know that everything is controlled completely on all levels of existence, just like this material world, it looks like it's complete chaos sometimes, right? <laughs> Who's in control? <laughs> it's, like, it's like, wow. But actually, the material energy, which is Krishna's external energy, the Maya Devi, she works in such a way as to keep everything working according to the desire of the living entity. And she rewards the living entity according to their pious activities. And she punishes the living entity according to their impious activities. So the living entity is the only living entity in the material world, Tatasta Shakti, is the only thing that ruins the whole thing, you know. <laughs> That's us. <laughs> Krishna's create everything is just so perfectly working out. But we have this independence because of our nature. <clears throat> what is our nature? Our nature is the same nature as Krishna. As it says in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Krishna's swara. I mean, he's totally and completely independent. He's only controlled by one thing, and that is love. And love is a power that's greater than him, but it's also his energy. He creates that also. So that energy controls Krishna, but he is totally independent in all aspects of his existence. But the living entity also is Swarat, but in a minute aspect of the same energy. So we have marginal independence, and we can choose how to use that pen independence. And if we use the independence in order to fulfill our desires to enjoy in this material world, that creates an anomaly in the, uh, the arrangement of the Lord. But there is a bailout program, and that is called Maya, and she comes just to straighten everything out. And that's called punishment. <laughs> So punishment, just like in the state, Prabhupada would use this example all the time, how the state is actually, um, ha creates the prison house, but the prison house is not what the state really wants for the living entities, but because their people are rebellious, there needs to be some rectification. So these same people who rebel can be reformed and again come back to normal life. And so the material energy is like that. It's a reformation program, that's all it is. <laughs> it's to reform the living entities from his desire to be separate from the Lord. And, and in that struggle to be separate from the Lord, um, one simply struggles. That's all, because it's that, that separateness is not even possible. And it actually explains in other places that actually we are never separated from the Lord. It's not possible. It's a consciousness. It's just like when you go to dr sleep at night, you dream. So you forget about your waking existence. So you're separated from your identity on the waking level. And sometimes through that dream state, you create another existence. And in that existence, you're seeing yourself differently. But this dream state ha has no reality. It's just a reflection of the, of the reality in a very, what we say, illusionary form. And then we wake up and then we go back, oh yeah, this is who I am, that it was just a dream, and then you re re return to our normal activities. So our normal activities is Jivar Sudupai Krishna and Nityadas, to, to serve Krishna eternally in all situations. And so the material world it works in such a way as to make sure the living entities get whatever they need in order to come back to their natural position of uh, devotional t to Krishna. Because devotional service to Krishna is the, is the foundation for where all success in life is. There are different forms of yoga by which one can perform. You have karma yoga. You know, offering the results of one's activities to Krishna, and then also trying to enjoy part of that results for oneself. 
You have jnana yoga, philosophical speculation on the absolute truth, meditating on the, the Lord within the heart, various types of elevations. But Krishna ends in the Bhagavad Gita, yoginam apisarvesham, madgaten venatmanaha, stradavan bhajate yomate me yuktaktamodvataha. That this bhakti yoga is the only process for, for success in material life. So you might ask why, and this is a question, why does Krishna allow the living entity to come to the material world and struggle and have to suffer? Good question, right? And some people will say, well, God is cruel, you know? He, he creates us, of course, we're never created, we're part of his existence. So there's that fraction, fractional part of his existence that is him, but at the same time, not him. It's an independent entity, and that's us. We have that identity. And somehow or other, we come to this material world. But why that independence is there, and that allows us to come to, the, to make a choice whether to stay in the spiritual world and serve, or to come to this material world and struggle. But then again, why is, it, why is the living entity in that situation where they can come and suffer? What is the purpose of the jiva? In other words, what's the purpose of the jiva? Interesting question. Why does the jiva have to be? Just like in the spiritual world, you have Krishna with his eternal parts and parcels. His, you know, Radharani is there, Mother Yasoda, Nanda Maharaj. Those are his, you know, they're on the same level as Krishna. They're actually also not jivas. So they never come to the material world and they're in fully engaged in loving devotional service to Krishna in the spiritual world. But there's a class, not class, but there's a category of living entities who come. So then the question is, why is that jiva created? Why didn't Krishna create all of the manifestations of his parts and parcels like the Vishnu tattvas in the spiritual world who are his, his associates? People say, well, what's the answer? Anybody know? Why, why are you you? <laughs> hmm. Yeah, we'll take a... Are you? <coughs> the innermost relationship of the soul to God is love. Love. And now love means choice. That I also cannot love. Yeah. If there's no choice, then where's the question of love? I love a particular person because of there's something special about this person and something I don't love. So we have the right to decide whether we want to be with Krishna or not Krishna. In this way, we can actually develop pure love. Yeah, but then in the spiritual world, there are living entities who are just like Nanda Maharaj, Maharaj. In other words, the, those who never, they're, they're nitya siddhas, and they never come to the material world. Why didn't he create just all of us as nitya siddhas? <laughs> <laughs> we are nitya siddha in one sense. Never was a time that I did not yeah, exist. We true. never have been created. <laughs> in that sense, you know, but uh, uh, you see some of us make this uh, eat from the forbidden tree, others don't. Yeah, you're going back to the choice principle, <laughs> Yeah, which is the nature of love, of course, without that loving choice there is no real expression of love. But the answer is, it's not Leela, it's Tattva, the answer is Tattva. In other words, there is an aspect to Krishna's existence that has to be fulfilled in order for Krishna to be the absolute truth. So we make up that missing part. And what is that? That the, etern that the absolute truth contains infinite and finite particles. 
So the absolute truth wouldn't be considered to be the absolute truth if it didn't have finite and infinite. So we are the finite. <laughs> so we make up the nature of the absolute truth from that. But because we're finite, we have a tendency to fall. But Krishna still loves you. <laughs> Aside from all of that. <laughs> but the Jai Sisi Radha Madhava Ki But there's another understanding that that is really interesting, just like we use the example of a dream, how when one goes to sleep at night, they dream. And in that different existence, so things are happening. One may be experiencing some happiness or one may experience some, some misery in that dream. So this material world, as Srila Prabhupada explained, is a dream. You're dreaming whatever you're dreaming about. <laughs> if you're dreaming about Krishna, it's not a dream. That's the reality. <laughs> but anything aside from that is, a dr is part of the illusionary dream state. So it has no reality. But it has a reality. <laughs> what is that reality? Because we, want, we identify with that as the reality and therefore it has an effect. Just like an anesthesia, just like an an they give, you know, sometimes they have, Prabhupada talks about certain people who are so very powerful that they don't even take an anesthesia when they take an operation. Prabhupada talks about Stalin in Russia. I know he's not so popular, but anyway. <laughs> he, uh, he had to have an operation, but he wanted to watch the operation. I think I can remember there was some thing they had to cut up open his he had some problems with his hand and so he didn't want it any anesthesia a very painful operation to go through but he wanted to watch just to see what was going on the <laughs> Prabhupada uses that example that there are there are certain personalities their minds are so strong they're not affected so much by the happiness and distress of the material world so that effect of happiness and stress is, the illu is, an, is an illusion. It's an illusion. So, but because there is an identity to, towards the illusion, there is an experience of happiness and distress. But happiness and distress is all relative, as Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would say. That uh, some people say this is good, and some people say this is bad, but I say it is all illusion. <laughs> Everything in the material world is bad. <laughs> Lord Chaitanya. So what he is saying that as long as the living entity puts any value on anything in this material world as, which is separated from Krishna, it has no real value. Only when it's connected to Krishna then it loses its uh, external uh, manifestation and it has value. So whatever we do, as Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita, whatever we think, whatever, another, our whole existence should center around simply Krishna or devotion to Krishna. And that is, the, that is reality. One who lives in that consciousness lives, actually. And anything separate from that is as it says in the Padma Purana, that what is the worst, what is the, what is the greatest anomaly, what is the greatest misfortune, what is the greatest mistake? <laughs> so you, the word greatest is there in, in the adjective in all of these three categories. Then it goes on to answer the question, it's rhetorical. The greatest mistake in analogy or misfortune is to forget the Supreme Personality of Godhead for one moment. Hare Krishna. <laughs> one moment. That's the actual verse. It's not, there's, I didn't, I, that's uh, practically a di direct uh, translation. So, yeah, so because in that forgetfulness we create an another existence. So how do you remember Krishna all the time? It's really not so easy, right? 
you got so many other things that are re you have to do and you have to concentrate on what you're doing. But thinking of Krishna or connecting everything with Krishna becomes easy when you see everything in relationship to Krishna. There's nothing separate from Krishna. And that's what this uh, whole verse and purport is saying, that all of these different categories, Prabhupada uses the example, smoke, fire, heat, light, are all part of fire. They're not separate, but at the same time, they are different. They make up the fire. So all of Krishna's energies, whether external, internal, or marginal, and the different categories within those manifestations, there's so many different categories of Krishna's energy that he uses in order to fulfill his desires and to carry out the creation and to also carry out the activities within the creation. They're all part of his energy. And Prabhupada would use a very ex nice example. Some he would he'd take his glasses and, and take his glasses and he'd hold it up and he'd say when you see these glasses what do you see what do you think and the devotees would say oh Prabhupada they're your glasses Prabhupada said correct the under, the right understanding so that's how you see everything you connect everything with the owner so everything is owned by Krishna, even your body. <laughs> That's not your, we give, we give the category your body, but actually it's not my body. It is the energy that is of the material nature which comes to formulate in the different you know, s proportions which creates the, the, the different bodies of the 8,400,000 species. But it's another energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So everything, when, when, when one understands that, there's nothing else to do but to serve Krishna or to surrender to Krishna. So the idea of this independence, which causes the living entity to create a false sense of reality, cause, which means to struggle. When, you're, when you create something false that is not connected to Krishna, you can't get any good results from that because it is automatically false. In other words, it's an illusion. And whatever result you may get ultimately is can destroyed in time, even if it is acceptable. But, in the, but as a devotee, a devotee thinks, oh, yeah, everything belongs to God. Therefore, that is called renunciation or detachment. Therefore, a devotee can be happy simply by devotional service. That's all. And that, that's the principle that is so important. We may have so many other things in our life that seems to be supportive of our existence, and they are in some case, but in ultimately we can do without everything except Krishna. <laughs> that's the only thing we can't live without is Krishna. And of course, Krishna means Krishna's devotees. When you say Krishna, you also say Krishna's devotees, because Krishna's devotees are an energy of Krishna also, and they make up the absolute truth also. So Krishna, Krishna's devotees, of course the activities of devotional service are also with including within that same internal spiritual energy. So it's interesting, this verse here, it um, goes on to explain them, that the living entity although s apparently separate is not separate, but it appears to be simply by that misuse of independence. Questions? Yes. Matiji, yeah. We have a microphone. <laughs> Thank you for your succinct brilliance, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Um, I'm intrigued by this um, interpretation of Svabhava. In the, both in the word for word and in the translation, it's described as the intuition or nature of the living, of the individual living beings. Why, can you shed some light on this word intuition? Why it's used here? Well, in nature, 
seems to be the exact explanation or definition of swabhava, one's nature. It said intuition or nature. It used both. Yeah, but the word intuition is added to the, the word for word. And what is natural is also intuitive. We, it is natural it is our nature to serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So that knowledge that comes through that is called intuition. Or that knowledge which is not separate from the soul's existence. The spiritual knowledge is also known as intuitive knowledge. That which is already known, when we get it from the outside, we just, we just remember what we are, that's all. <laughs> that the soul is by nature chit. Is, is, does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Yeah. Pass yeah. it here? Or? Yeah, sure. That makes it easy. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Thank you so much for your uh, nice class. Made everything very clear. <clears throat> you quoted a verse from the Padma Puran. Um, and you said there were three things, mistake, anomaly, and misfortune. Right. I was wondering if you could complete the other two and if you could give a reference to the shloka. What's the? Uh, the Padma Puran, you mentioned there were three things in the shloka, the greatest mistake, misfortune, and anomaly. And the yeah. mistake was to forget Krishna even for a moment. That it, yeah, it is the greatest mistake, the greatest misfortune, greatest anomaly. Okay, so there's just one answer for all three. Yeah. Because I was thinking maybe the uh, misfortune would be the um, lack or not having an association of devotees. It wasn't that? Well, if you don't have that, you're going to forget Krishna, <laughs> obviously. But it doesn't refer to that. It, it talks about, you know, the principle of remembrance, just like Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, manmana bhava madhvata, always remember me. So in the same way that verse is illustrating that one who goes outside of that always remembering Krishna, they are setting themselves up for misfortune. It's a mistake, they're setting themselves up for misfortune, and it's incongruent with one's nature, the anomaly principle. Mm -hmm. and, and thank this you so much for that other answer. Uh, I've had this question for years, and I've gone to many different, uh, well, I've gone to a couple of very senior devotees, sannyasis, about why uh, there's even the marginal entity, and why right. is there the marginal energy? Why are we marginal entities? And um, it just reminds me of the purport of Om Purnam Adha Purnam, where... Um, yeah, it's actually Prabhupada poses that question and answers the question. It's in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adi Lila, chapter 7, verse 116 in the purport. 1716? Uh, 7116 Adi Lila. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. He, he, Prabhupada poses that. You know, it's quite a, a remote point, but he makes it there. You know. Why do the living entities exist? Because they make up the finite aspect of the absolute. I mean, yeah, the finite, yeah, the limited. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, we, we, that's, that discussion came up with many senior devotees, and we went on for, for weeks trying to find the answer. Finally, someone found it. <laughs> Interesting. Yes. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, uh, you said that the jiva has, the marginal potency has the tendency to fall, to become illusioned. So, uh, it is Krishna's energy only which bewilders us and puts us into this illusion. So, like, some po suppose a jiva comes in connection with some sense object, like suppose I see some gulab jam, we immediately, be, I immediately become bewildered that I can enjoy this, and, but that is Krishna's energy. That is Krishna's energy which is causing us to become illusioned. So why is it that while practicing bhakti that uh, we become illusioned by Krishna's energy itself to be away from Krishna? Like why can't Krishna support us to become close to him? He does. 
You just got to pay attention. <laughs> He's always supporting you every minute. He's in the heart. Prabhupada would say the super soul is dictating to the living entity constantly about how the living entity can come back to him. But to hear God in the heart, as it explains in the Bhagavad Gita, that the mind has to, mind and senses have to be fully controlled. When the mind and senses are fully controlled, the super souls is already reached, and happiness and distress, honor and dishonor, heat and cold are all the same. The dualities are no longer existing. So Krishna is always helping us, but still he doesn't take away that independence. Now if the Globjamin is prashadam, that's spiritual. But if it's boga, it's material. <laughs> so the same, the same item that we look at or we want to enjoy, it depends where it fits in. If we want to use it for Krishna, I want to take this Globjamin so I can uh, nourish my body and uh, serve Krishna nicely. You think of it in that way, that's spiritual. He wants distress. What about distress? Like this is for enjoyment. Then the, the stress is just a, a mental creation. That's all. We create the stress. That's all. It's it's another part of you know the anxiety we experience when we try to enjoy separately. All of these negative characteristics are due to our our desire to enjoy separately. Yes, Mishu Bhagavan. <laughs> the other day I heard Prabhupada say that uh, old means ugly. What, what does? Old. Old means ugly? Yeah, that's an exact quote. So, and we've well, seen this practically that people who, when they get older, their the, the, the bodies aren't attractive anymore. Um, in well, look at world. nature. What, what happened there? You know, there's the same features. People have eyes, ears, nose, everything. No, else. actually, uh, old is beautiful. Okay. Look at nature. Spring is more or less, I'm going the four seasons according to the Western. Spring is the youth part of life. Summer is the, the main part of life where we enjoy it. And fall, autumn, is when we gradually start to get old. And winter is death. If you align the force, so autumn is very beautiful in the Western countries. The, the trees are all full of colors, like that. So, yeah, the, it's the most beautiful season of the world is the autumn. So old age is nice. Youth is a folly. You make so many mistakes then. <laughs> they say youth is folly because we we have an idea that you know we're going to enjoy. You know, we got all our plans. When you go through life, you start to learn and understand and experience, and you become more focused on the important things in life. Old is not ugly. <laughs> So in overcoming Maya, um, we have to make endeavor, and there is Krishna's mercy. As we learn in Damodar Leela, there is our endeavor, and there is Krishna's mercy. <coughs> Both are required. Right. right. So yeah. how much, like sometimes we make endeavor, but we are not successful. Mm. And we, like this Gulab Jamun example, we may succumb to something. So. Should we blame ourselves? Should we what? Blame ourselves for our not being successful? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we it's a good idea. That way you can try harder next time. Yes. Because <laughs> if you think it's somebody else's fault, then you got a problem. Because <laughs> then you don't really think, you know, oh, it was therefore I didn't do it. And then you're taking the responsibility away from yourself. But, you know, 
Prabhupada also said, if you want to blame somebody, blame Krishna because he's the control source of everything. <laughs> he controls everything. But that's not a healthy idea either. <laughs> Prabhupada was just saying that just to let us know that behind the, everything is the hand of the Lord ultimately. So, so I was thinking that there is on the intellectual platform we can resist temptations. And then there is when you have spiritual advancement, when you get taste, then automatically, as Krishna says, when you get a higher taste, then you don't even hanker for the lower taste. Right. So on the intellectual platform, you can sustain only so much for some time. I mean, it, unless you get a higher taste, when you get a higher yeah. taste. So and that higher taste is, gi is given by Krishna himself because yeah. it's Krishna who gives us the higher taste. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yes. Yeah. So go for the higher taste. Mm -hmm. And you use the intellect to serve the Lord, that's all. Jiva Goswami makes that point. He says the ke connection between uh, the living entity and bhakti is the intelligence. Using the intelligence to apply the principles of devotional service in the service of the Lord. But does that intelligence also come from Krishna? Yeah, he says that. Rasaham apsakuntiya prabhasmi sahya surya pranava sarvaveri sho sabdike purusham dishu. I am the ability in all living entities. He also says it again. Sarvashicha hamridi sani visto mata smirtir gyanam apohanam cha. I give intelligence also. So if you want intelligence for material activities, the Lord will also supply that in general. That's a general statement. For a devotee, he won't really do that because he doesn't want you to go in that direction. But he's giving intelligence, or he's giving us the ability to use our intelligence in the way that we desire. I was remembering the statement Prabhupada made, why is Maya so strong? Somebody asked, he says, Maya is not strong, your purpose is weak. He yeah, said. exactly. Maya is your friend. Prabhupada said, Maya, we have, Prabhupada said, no, we have no problem with Maya. But because there are demons, Maya has to do her service. That's the problem, demons. <laughs> Maya is a friend of the devotee because she helps the devotee become Krishna conscious. Anyone else? Yes, Sri Devi. Thank you, Maharaj, for the class. Here in the purport, this uh, particular sentence is a little difficult for me to understand. It says, all phenomenal manifestations, as well as the effulgence of the body of Vasudev, are his impersonal features. But the phenomenal manifestation itself consists of the variegatedness of all living entities, which are individual spirit souls. So how is it clubbed as the impersonal feature of the Lord? The living entities live within the Brahmin fulgence. Mm -hmm. So that Brahmin fulgence is the, the external energy, not external, but it's the internal energy of the Lord, but it's, it's the padantita tatat vidyan, yaj jnanam avyan, brahmeti paramatmeti, bhagavaneti sabjate. The absolute truth is divided into three, Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. So within the Brahman of Fulgence, the living entities exist. So that is called the, as it's mentioned here, the effulgence of the Lord, and it's called the impersonal aspect. So the absolute truth contains both impersonal and personal features. But not all living entities are in the impersonal Brahman effulgence. No, there are many in the spiritual world. <laughs> As long as you're in the material world, yeah, you're in that energy. Thank you, Maharaj. Anything else? Anyone else? 
Someone else? Oh, okay, there's a question there. What is the time? Do we, do we have five minutes to, to nine? Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, you just explained uh, Krishna and Krishna devotees makes absolute truth. So I just wonder if you can explain a bit more on it. Well, the absolute truth contains both infinite and finite particles. We are considered to be finite because we have a tendency to be overcome by another energy, which is the external energy. We don't lose our spiritual existence, which is superior to the material existence, but because we identify ourselves differently, then we get caught, captured by that same energy. But we are, we, we're still a, a, a pure spirit existence. It's the illusion that, that causes us to get captured by the external energy and to think differently, to act differently. But the absolute truth contains both of these energies, limited and unlimited. In one sense, the living entity is unlimited because he's part of Krishna. In another sense, he's limited because he has a tendency to come to the material world to take on a body and identify with that body as, the, as one's existence. And therefore, he acts in a, in a limited way. <laughs> Because material means limited. Mm -hmm. Spiritual means unlimited. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Okay, uh, yeah. Preetu Prabhu? Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm, and you say the living entity is finite. <coughs> Are the living entities who are infinitesimal? Krishna is for sure and all his expansions are. But there are many living entities who are not Krishna or Jiva, yeah. right? And so are there Jivas who are infinitesimal? Are you saying that? Is there Jivas that are what? There, you said some of the Jivas are finite. Does it mean there are Jivas in the spiritual world, unless they're expansions of God in one way or another, who are infinitesimal? They're, of the, they're really, of the same nature as Krishna. What I'm getting at is this. They're, they're also Vishnu Shakti. Since, Vishnu yeah, yeah. Since Prabhupada said that love is based on choice. Yeah, we, that, we, are made, we are made, obviously, that we can choose to yeah. love or not to love. But in the spiritual world, are you saying that they're living energies, they're set in such a way they can only love, they're not, they don't have the capacity to choose? But they don't choose. <laughs> That might because be. Do, they the, the same. Like, do they have the capacity to choose? Mother Yasoda, Nanda Maharaj, you know, Sridham, all of Krishna's eternal associates. Yeah. They don't come to this world. If they do come, they come as an energy of themselves in order to assist. But they remain still in the spiritual world. And does it mean then? that some living entities are created to automatically be second-class citizens. No living entity is created. Right, but by nature, eternal nature, the eternal nature is that You have Vishnu Shakti, and you have, then you have uh, Jiva Shakti, and then you have the different categories within that. So those, though, there are personalities in the spiritual world that are Vishnu Shakti, and they're not Krishna. They are also Krishna's eternal associates. They are the, his intimate associates in the spiritual world. If they do come, they come as an energy of themselves to manifest their pastimes in this world to assist Krishna when he comes. That's all. But they, they still remain in the spiritual world. Yeah, it's, so we see sometimes, just like it says, Dara and what was it, Dara and Drona, they become, became Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yasoda in this world. So they somehow qualified themselves through tense austerity. But 
that mother Yasoda in the material world is made up of that jiva as Drona, Dara, is it Dara? Yeah, Dara. And the energy of Mother Yasoda coming from the spiritual world also. So there's like two or three souls in one body. Mm -hmm. That's mentioned, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, about, this is about you me very philosophical here. <laughs> Okay, we, one cannot live by philosophy alone. One has to take prasad. Okay. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. <laughs>